he was from the moon. I mean, this guy or, or some other planet. I mean, he was crazy. And whatever Tony'd say, he'd say, oh, yeah, 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 oh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a girl, I'm a girl, I'm a girl. Oh, my God. My name is Josephine. Sad. Yeah. It's lost nothing, nothing. You sit in that theater and you giggle. And that's what a movie's supposed to make you do. I'm Sugar King. Hi. Jack had a nightmare that uh, they were up to the 50th take with uh, Marilyn. And she finally got it right, and he blew his line. <laughs> when I was a little girl on cold nights like this, I used to crawl into bed with my sister. We'd cuddle up under the covers and pretend we were lost in a dark game but trying to find our way out. <laughs> <laughs> There's situation after situation in Some Like It Hot that, that's just irresistible. Uh, being stuck on a train in an all-girl compartment in berths where Marilyn Monroe is trying to hide in your birth. I mean, it's, it's just catnip. In 1958, Billy Wilder, the writer-director famous for Double Indemnity, Sunset Boulevard, and The Seven Year Itch, made a film which began like a virtual throwback to silent cinema. It was in black and white, and for the first three minutes, not a word of dialogue was spoken. It was recently voted the best comedy of all time by the members of the American Film Institute. And in the twisted logic of Hollywood, there's now talk of remaking this masterpiece to cash in on its renewed classic status. My advice to anybody that wants to remake a Billy Wilder film is don't. Uh, I mean, I, I got my fingers burned badly uh, doing it. The critics just murdered me. But to try to remake Some Like It Hot, I think, would be suicide. I mean, Some Like It Hot is an iconic movie. It's, it's now been voted the, the best comedy of all time. Why in hell would you ever, would you want to remake it? I think there's only a downside to that. You know, remakes are questionable anyway. Uh, I don't believe in them, but I suppose if you're going to do a remake, then remake an old, obscure movie or a foreign movie that nobody saw. I could see doing that. My brother and I decided to form an independent company, which we uh, called the Mirish Company, and made a deal with United Artists for them to distribute our films. We uh, talked to Billy about the possibility of his doing a film for us, and he had an idea about possibly remaking an old German film, which was called Fanfare de Liebe. Fanfares of Love. It was basically the story of, of two musicians during the height of, of depression in Berlin who, desperate to find a job, accept an assignment with an all-girls band. Except for that, uh, Fanfares of Love as very little or nothing in common with Some Like It Hot. Well, what kind of a band is it anyway? You gotta be under 25. We could pass for that. You gotta be blonde. We What's could it? dye our hair. And you gotta be girls. We could, no we couldn't. He came to me first, Billy Wilder. I was, we used to, we used to run screenings at Harold Mirish's house. And I remember one day, Harold Mirish said to me, come by a little earlier, Tony. Uh, Billy wants to talk to you. So I went by a little early and Billy took me to a little room and he said, Tony, I'm going to make a movie where two musicians see a murder and they have to dress up as women to escape in a girls' band. I think they started thinking about casting very early because of pictures and cast properly, you can't make it. It's one of those in which there wasn't possible to make too much of a substitution. Uh, they had uh, Tony Curtis uh, first. Uh, Billy very much wanted to use Jack as the other actor, but he felt that if he couldn't use Jack, Tony could play either part. So Tony was signed originally. Then the people with the money decided that Jack was not a big enough star at this point, and they wanted him to use Sinatra. He said he was going to get Frank Sinatra, 
to play one part and Mitzi Gaynor to play the other. After about a week, he called me in again and said he wasn't going to do that because he felt Frank Sinatra would be too much trouble. Billy made a date with Sinatra for lunch to discuss it with him, and Sinatra didn't show up. And about the same time, or shortly thereafter, Billy heard from Marilyn, who said she would like to work with him again. And he said, OK. And once you have Marilyn and Tony, Jack is now a big enough star. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe had worked with Wilder before, on The Seven Year Itch. She'd been studying method acting at Lee Strasberg's actor's studio and had ambitions as a serious actress. Monroe's husband, playwright Arthur Miller, encouraged her to accept the role in Wilder's latest comedy to take her mind off a recent miscarriage. Marilyn's commitment finally freed Wilder to offer Jack Lemmon the part. He said, if you take the part, you're going to be in drag for 85% of the picture. Do you want to do it? I thought for about two split seconds, and then I said yes. And he says, OK, I'll send you a script sometime. And I said, OK, thanks very much. And we said good night. And we got outside, and Felicia immediately said, why did you say yes without a script? And I said, because it's Billy Wilder. That's why. He Now he knows that I'm going to play that part. He'll write the part with me in mind. This was Wilder's second collaboration with co-writer IAL Diamond, known as Iz, who teamed up with the director the previous year. The pair would go on to write another ten films together, including The Apartment, Kiss Me Stupid, and The Fortune Cookie. Billy always, as far as writing and directing went, he felt that the writer was 90-some-odd percent of the whole film, that directing was just the drudgery of getting it on film the way he wanted it without somebody else misinterpreting what he did, and that, which is why he started directing. Wilder and Diamond took the spine of Fanfare and Der Lieber, the train compartment the two men share with the all-girl band, the scenic resort hotel where the musicians are booked to perform, and the romance between one of the men and the lead singer of the band, which results in a series of quick changes in and out of drag. On these bare bones, they fleshed out a farcical structure for their screwball masterpiece. They always talk the structure out completely long before anybody wrote anything. Uh, they knew exactly where they were going. When they say we had an unfinished script, they weren't improvising. They had everything carefully worked out. And on individual scenes, they would have mostly roughed out because they, since they had the structure, they knew where each scene had to go, what direction it had to feed in anyway. Well, that solves one problem. Now we don't have to worry about who we're going to pay first. Quiet, I'm thinking. <laughs> of course, the landlady's going to lock us out. Mow down at the delicatessen, no more Canuck worst on credit. We can't borrow from the girls because they're on the way to jail. Shut up. And we'll... All dialogue scenes talk, were talked out. Uh, and is when he was working at home, uh, talked all the time to the typewriter, listening to the cadence of the, uh, of the dialogue. And I'm sure they work much the same way in the office. I wonder how much Sam the bookie will give us for our overcoats. Sam the bookie? There's nothing doing. You're not going to put my overcoat on a dog. Oh, you... Look, you, Jerry, I told you it's a sure thing. We will freeze. It is below zero. We'll get pneumonia. Look, Stu, but he's ten to one. Tomorrow we'll have twenty overcoats. Joe. Lemon and Curtis's comic banter reflects Wilder and Diamond's own partnership, the disrespectful intimacy of two writers who spent every working day together. Greased lightning! Dude, why do I listen to you? You ought to have my head examined. I thought you weren't talking to me. Look at a bow fiddle. It's dressed warmer than I am. From the beginning, Billy uh, felt that there had to be a very strong motivation for these two uh, uh, libidinous uh, 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 young men to uh, dress themselves as, as women. And uh, he, he came up. He came up with one of the best, which is to put this whole thing in the, in the middle of the St. Valentine's Day massacre and have these two boys being pursued by the worst gangster mob in America. Joe, where are you running? As far away as possible. It's not far enough. You don't know those guys. They know us. Every hood in Chicago's going to be after us, Joe. 
I've forgotten how long went by, but quite a long time. And then about 60 pages came up to my house one morning. I sat down right there and then with a cup of coffee and read the 60 pages, and I thought I was going to split a gut. I was laughing out loud. I fell off the couch at one point. <laughs> I really did. I started laughing and rolled over and turned and so forth. The script went all over the room. I straightened that out and finished. And uh, then I went into the studio to Billy's office and uh, so forth. I said, Billy, is the, the funniest 60 pages of a script that I've ever read. And he said, well, wonderful. He said, the rest of it we finish while we shoot. It keeps us on our toes and gives us something at the end of each day of shooting. Uh, it gives us something to do. Marilyn Monroe's contract stipulated that all her movies be made in color, which was becoming a commercial necessity. So Wilder had to convince her and the Mirish brothers that despite its high $2.3 million budget, the film would work better in black and white. Billy made a very convincing argument that making a period story would play better in black and white than color. And also, he felt that the makeup on the two boys would be less blatant in black and white than it would be in color. And frankly, that's what convinced me that he was right about that and, and, and we should make the picture in black and white. We had makeup tests which were drudgery because we went through a week of Tony and me sitting side by side, he with his makeup man, and me with Harry Ray. I finally realized after about four days that more and more with the bee sting lips, and um, which I wanted because of, of, of any time he would smile, or the change in the, in the face that it would create, like a, some crazy thing. Anyway, um, I realized more and more that I was getting to look like a bad imitation of my mother. We were doing great until we started to have to dress up like women. And I got really nervous dressed up like a woman. I didn't like it. I, I felt awkward. And uh, Billy Wilder would laugh at himself silly as I came out. Very prim, very proper, very made up, beautiful, but very aloof. Jack Lemon, on the other hand, was like a $3 pretzel, you know. He just loved the idea to dress up in women's clothes and prounce around. Finally, it was about the fifth day, I think, the two makeup men said, uh, we think this is great. And I said, what do you think, Tony? He says, I'm happy. And I said, so am I. Let's go show Billy. And he said, wait a minute, I got a better idea. He said, let's go to the ladies' room in the, in the commissary and see what, what happens. See if they catch on to us right away or, or what. And I said, okay, so we walked down to the commissary. We walked into the ante room, sort of, in the big ladies' toilet, and we started putting uh, lipstick over our lipstick, you know, and just chatting and talking and using these phony voices and so forth. And uh, girls came out, they'd look in the mirror and say, hi. We'd say, hi, how are you? And uh, so they, they didn't bat an eyeball, not one of them. There was a whole slew of little laws that were necessary. You walked on the ball of your feet. You let your bottom sway from one side to the other. And that's why you wore three, four, five inch heels. So it kicked your ass up in the air. So we went up to Billy's office and he looked at the two of us and he said, oh, it looks good to me. And uh, then uh, Tony and I told him about what, what, what we had done. And he said, that did it. Don't change anything. Leave it the way it is. Let's go, Josephine. Not a girl, Geraldine. Rosella? Move along, Dolores, will you? Trombone? Hey, Olga, how's your back? Trump, Trump. The first scene we shot was when we go on the train. And I came straight from the beach to there. And of course, we didn't have a script then. That was just the first day of shooting. But it was at the back lot of MGM. 
And that's where Marilyn walked, walked down next to the train. Yeah. And the train went, yeah. woo, woo, and she moved like that and kept walking. She was outrageous, just outrageous. <laughs> I rather felt that the, uh, the steam was sort of a first cousin to uh, the scene that Billy shot with her in, uh, in Seven Year Itch where the air thing comes up and blows her skirt up. And that uh, he was rather uh, trying to top himself. <laughs> Marilyn was supposed to come trouncing down looking for the band. And Billy Wilder was standing on the side, and, and Paula Stutzberg was standing on the other side. And Marilyn never took her eyes off Paula. Billy Wilder was directing the movie. But uh, she wouldn't spend any time looking at him. She was just Paula. I'd come back, he'd stop. Billy's standing here. She'd look over to Paula to see what Paula had to say. Paula would nod or not. Finally, we did another take. And this time, uh, Billy Wilder said, Cut! He turned around and looked at Paula. He says, how was that for you, Paula? Well, Paula almost fainted in the chair. And that was the end of that trouble for Billy Wilder, you know? Running wild, lost control. Running wild, mighty bold. Feeling gay, reckless too. Carefree mind all the time, never blue. Jack Cole did the dance for Marilyn. When she did Running Wild down the thing, Jack Cole was in back of the camera doing Running Wild, and Marilyn was doing Jack Cole. That's how she got the thing, with Jack Cole doing the whole choreography, watching her right in the back of the film. Amazing, totally amazing. Running Wild. The scene in the upper berth was really the funniest time I ever spent on a set. And it was so funny, cause it got so hilarious that actually Billy Wilder broke up during a couple of takes, which you don't do on the set. Everybody else was trying to hold themselves in, and Billy finally, <laughs> they had to cut it because he had, he had interrupted it with, with a laughing. Hey, there's a party in Upper Seven. Oh, 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 Party in Upper Seven. Party in Upper Seven. And we were all going that. in there, remember? remember oh, mine was that? running in with this, uh, I was running in with Ice, Ice, the name. Yeah. Who's, right. oh, oh yeah, Ice, Ice, where's the Ice? And the who's got the salami? Right oh, here's the vermouth. The, this is a private party, will you please go away? I you pour can... some cheese and crackers in case anybody gets hungry. What is this? Ten cups be enough? Party for two, two, ten cups, what is <laughs> Please, girls, will you please stop this? Oh, it was terrible. I was black and blue because yeah. I was next to Marilyn and I came in with the martini mixer, which was a uh, hot water bottle. Here's the cocktail shaker. We were so tight, because there were like 13 of us in that small space. I tell you, I, when I'd get out of that, because we were there six hours sometimes, I could hardly walk. 13 girls in the purse is bad luck. 12 of you have to get out. Pass me the peanut butter. Anyone for salami? Billy Wilder, with his hands, he tried to direct the actor, Jack Lemon, or Meryl Monroe, or us. Watch that Even in the drunk sequence, the upper berth, how he had us do it. And darling, 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 please put the cracker in there this way. All right? You're not putting it quite the little moves hands around. And, and it worked. It was magic time. <laughs> now. we shot in Del Coronado, where we did all the exteriors. And the picture was a lot of fun then, you know? Marilyn was right on, there was no trouble with her, no trouble with anybody. We were able to shoot and get all of the exterior of, of the hotel. The boat coming away, uh, the uh, beach scene, me with my shell. There were a whole slew of uh, scenes that were attributed to 
they're shooting there. And uh, they were wonderful, you know. They had a, uh, a nice spontaneity about them. It was great fun. It's beautiful. We had fun shooting there. It was great. The only problem we had was it, it's near uh, an Army or Navy base, I think. Airplanes kept coming over and uh, it would blow the sound in a take. And you have to squeeze the takes in between. And they were just going all day long. Daddy, I had no idea you're such a big girl. Oh, sugar, you should have seen me before I went in a diet. Oh. I mean, your shoulders and your arms. Oh, well, I... That's from carrying that bull fiddle around all day. Oh, there's one thing I envy you for. What's that? You're so flat-chested. Clothes hang better on you than they do on me. By now, Marilyn was pregnant again and increasingly concerned about suffering another miscarriage. An early sign of this new insecurity was the way in which a relaxation exercise taught her by Paula Strasberg was transformed into a distinctive nervous tick. Dilly Wilder would say, Madeline and darling, magic time. And I must tell you, I don't know whether she was nervous or not. She would flip her hands like this. And he'd go, are you ready? You know, she was scared, she was pregnant. Billy never said cut. Marilyn would just stop on her own because it wasn't right to her. She would just stop and shake her hands each time. It was a mental thing. She emotionally was unable to face the cameras until she felt like it. Five, six, Oh, I'm terribly sorry. My fault. You're not hurt, are you? I don't think so. I wish you'd make sure. Why? Because usually when people find out who I am, they get themselves a wheelchair, a shyster lawyer, and sue me for three quarters of a million dollars. I could have played my own voice. Of course, she wouldn't have recognized it because I had a female voice in it. But I said I wanted to do something a little unique, you know? And I had this kind of half-assed Cary Grant... Hello, my darling, I do believe I've got a pebble in my left boot. Get out of my way, I want to look at my yacht. Uh, I only come ashore twice a day when the tide goes out. Oh. It's on account of these shells. That's my hobby. You collect shells? Yes, yeah, so did my father and my grandfather. You might say we had a passion for shells. That's why we named the oil company after it. Shell oil? When the picture was over, Billy Wilder showed it to Cary Grant and... Cary Grant said, uh, I don't talk like that. He took, he took umbrage from it. We wanted the exteriors to be finished first before we uh, moved into the studio. The Coronado shoot, I thought, went quite well. We came back to the studio and, of course, uh, problems developed with Marilyn. She had ills, she had insecurities, many, many difficulties which uh, led to uh, multiple takes and uh, rather tried the patience of her fellow actors and uh, most particularly uh, Billy Wilder. She really wanted to be taken seriously and um, certainly playing the character of Sugar wasn't serious. I mean she was she was playing right into her stereotype which I don't think she likes much. I don't think I'm a drinker. I can stop any time I want to, only I don't want to, especially when I'm blue. We understand. All the girls drink. It's just that I'm the one that gets caught. Story of my life. I always get the fuzzy end of the lollipop. She was having already some trouble of showing up, getting the makeup right. Did she do it right? And Billy Wilder was so kind to her. He said, I'm going to print it. Every time you get it right, it'll be printed, Marilyn. You don't have to worry. The boys will have to get it right every time you get it right. Unlike almost every other director in town, uh, Billy shot 
always in master scenes. He did very little in the way of covering shots. He didn't, uh, you know, when he had to have a close-up or when he had to have something to, color, to cover uh, a walk across the room or something, he might uh, break it up. But mostly he shot in master scenes. Which is important, which is stopping? Well, that depends. <laughs> that depends on whether you're coming or going. I mean, normally, normally the aft is on the other side of the stern. But, and that's the bridge, so that you can get from one side of the boat to the other. Would you like a glass of champagne? I love it. Which way? Oh, you have an upstairs and a downstairs. Yes, that's the hurricane cellar. And another nice thing about this yacht, lot of closet space. Billy had his supervising editor, uh, Don Harrison, uh, sat on the set with him. If he had concerns about something, he, he and Don would talk it over and decide what the coverage should be, and that's all he shot. He didn't go into deep coverage, you know, where it was master shot, over shoulder, over shoulder, close up, close up. And you end up with all of this film, you know, and you only needed about half of it. So if you're shooting a master scene and somebody blows a line, you haven't blown just that little bit. You've blown the whole damn thing. You've lost half the morning. So it made it particularly difficult when somebody like Marilyn consistently managed to screw a screen up. Oh, yeah, well, I did a scene with her in, in, uh, on the yacht where uh, she points up above on the archway. And she says, uh, what is that? What is it? And I got up and I said, it's a member of the Herring family. Amazing how they get those big fish into those little glass jars. Well, it took us a week and a half to get that one. What is it? It's a member of the Herring family. She'd start out and say, What is that? Oh, it's a member of the Herring, member of the Herring family. Well, what, what, what does it do? Well, it's a member of the Herring family. You know, there was always, What is that? Am I supposed to say that? Or you, at one point, the line was, what is that? What is it? It's a member of the Herring family. She, she got so flustered, she finally said, Tony, with her lips. I said, yes, Marilyn, what's the line? I said, what is it? She said, what is it? I said, that's it. What is it? What is it? It's a member of the Herring family. So we had these little frightening experiences. I came down on the set one day when uh, Tony and Marilyn were shooting their love scene where he does Cary Grant and she's kissing him to see if it works. We all sat around for two hours before she would come out of her dressing room and we just all sat and waited. Finally she came out and said, I'm sorry, like this, and then she was ready and she and Tony started doing the scene. Billy uh, Wilder, when they got all ready to do the scene, he said to Marilyn, now will, will you kiss Tony? So the, the uh, cameraman can be sure it's just exactly right. And she said, no, I'll do it when we do it. So she refused to kiss Tony. And that, maybe that's what he made him kind of mad. She, she, she wouldn't kiss him on the rehearsal until they did the shot. And then they did the shot, and of course she kissed him, and it all came out great. But I don't know, I don't know whether it was any kind of antagonism on her part at all, or whether she was trying to be a method actress, which I think she was. Where did you learn to kiss like that? I used to sell kisses for the milk fun. It's a wonderful scene. But when we were in the rushes, and Tony denies this today, because I would too, I probably, if I had said it, because he didn't really mean it, of, of course. But when the rushes ended, of the scene and the lights went on, Tony stood up and as he was standing up, he said, it's like kissing Hitler. Well, Jesus. I said, did he? Did he? he didn't really say that, did he? Yeah, he did. Woo. Once the, those scenes were done, a rumor came out that uh, I said kissing her was like kissing Hitler. I never said it. Tony Curtis stood up and made this famous remark of just like kissing Hitler. Well, there was, a, of course, a complete dead silence in the room. Everybody just froze up. And I remember looking at Paula Strasberg, and she went, you know, just 
clenched her fists and everything like that. And of course, everybody thought, my God, she'll go and tell Marilyn, and Marilyn won't do, finish the film. Whether or not Strasbourg told her, Monroe was to prove increasingly unpredictable as her pregnancy developed. Barely a month after filming ended, her worst fears were realized when she suffered a second miscarriage. But for the rest of the shoot, scenes were rescheduled to allow filming to continue without her when she failed to turn up. Hi, Jerry. Everything under control? Have I got things to tell you? What happened? I'm engaged. Congratulations. Who's the lucky girl? I am. I did not ever think of, of uh, Moragas, and it wasn't in the script. I don't know if it was put into the script after we shot it or not, the final draft, but um, there was no indication of that. And I had timed it differently when I was just running lines with Felicia. And I thought I had it great. And I went into the studio happy as a clam and uh, walked onto the set, and there was Billy with these things going like this. <laughs> and I said, what the hell is he doing? So forth, and then Billy saw me, he says, I... he says, here, go get made up, take these with you. And uh, he said, in between every line, just go da, 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 and sing whatever you want and just make a concerted effort to uh, blow your lid with happiness about uh, the engagement. I said, uh-huh, okay. I called Felicia from my dressing room. I said, well, you can't believe this. The man is already, we haven't even shot it. He's made a disaster out of this scene. He doesn't know what he's doing. And he may be great, and uh, I thought he was, but I said, he's lost it, I'm telling you. I had oodles of that stuff, of the men, uh, uh, after each line, in two shots, one, the way I could control the length of that thing. What did Jack Lemmon say to that? Well, he, he, first of all, I think he was outraged that I'm, that I'm screwing up in one of his best scenes. Then he began to understand it. And then he always mentions that, you know, to show what a resourceful director I am. Jerry, you better lie down. You're not well. Will you stop treating me like a child? I'm not stupid. I know there's a problem. I'll say there is. His mother. We need her approval. But I'm not worried because I don't smoke. <laughs> Jerry! When I saw the film and heard an audience reaction, laughing all through from the line, all through this, before, then they never missed the next line. That was the whole idea. Hey, these are real diamonds. Of course they're real. What do you think, my fiancé is a bum? Now I guess I'll have to give it back to him. Wait a minute, Jerry. Huh? Let's not be hasty. After all, we don't want to hurt Osgood's feelings, do we? Huh? Just a minute. It's me, Sugar. Andere Szenen, wo sie einen Satz nur sagen muss, und das haben wir 83 Mal gemacht. It's me, Sugar. Sugar, it's me. Now it's me, Sugar. Das ist ungedeckt. Uh, also nach der 30. Aufnahme, no, look, we're gonna put that on the door, written down, with a Reisnagel. It's me, Sugar. Just a minute. Sugar, it's me. 83 Mal. Nach der 60. Nach dem 60. Aufnahme habe ich jetzt die Seite genommen und habe gesagt, Marilyn, come on, relax. He said, don't worry. He said, worry about what? <laughs> After she had blown the It's Me Sugar, she was supposed to open the door, come in, and say, where's the bourbon? And she's looking in the drawer of a, of a chest for the, and they put the, they finally put the line on a piece of paper in each of the drawers, so she kept seeing it. And she kept not being able to remember it. The thing is, she had her back to the camera. They can dub it later. There was no need to have whatever huge number of takes they took. Where's that bourbon? I think it became, she is by God going to say this line, or we'll be here until December. I mean, uh, it was, I say, a contest of wills. You don't know 
what they're like. You fall for them, you really love them. You think this is going to be the biggest thing since the Graf Zeppelin. The next thing you know, they're borrowing money from you. They're spending it on other dames and betting on horses. You don't say. Then one morning you wake up, the guy's gone, the saxophone's gone. All that's left behind is a pair of old socks and a tube of toothpaste, all squeezed out. So you pull yourself together. You go on to the next job, the next saxophone player. It's the same thing all over again. You see what I mean? Not very bright. Uh, if she gets the line out, absolute perfect, perfect in, in uh, uh, timing, the sound of her voice. She knew what, where the joke was. She, she was not a dilettante. She was born with that kind of gift. Because, uh, you know, you can have 50 actresses. They may have been all quite good. Some of them may be more, more, uh, uh, um, e not efficient, but let us say technicians, great technicians, but nobody would have been better than her. Goodbye to spring and all it meant to me. Irreplaceable she may have been, but Munro's chronic unreliability meant that a 50-day filming schedule was soon stretched to more than 70, as these daily call sheets reveal. Dear Bob, I know you are just as much concerned about some like it hot as Marilyn Monroe has been out because of so-called illness for a total of 12 days. A small part of this illness is covered by insurance, but the rest of it is on account of pregnancy. As of today, it is absolutely necessary to have her for six additional days to finish the picture. Okay. And don't mess up the cake. I promise to bring back a piece of my kids. I got a naked girl, stuck her in the cake. Billy Wilder was having a terrible time. His back was hurting him, and you know, he's having a lot of trouble with Marilyn at that time. So I, I got a local stripper, and I put her in the cake. For he's a jolly good fellow, which nobody can deny. And just when they roll out the cake, and the machine gun out leaps this beautiful nude woman. Well, I thought Billy would faint. He was standing next to me, but what does that tell you? I said, it's for you. Happy birthday to you. And we all sang happy birthday to Billy. It was a little a little way to kind of try to take the edge off the movie, you know? And I liked it a lot. Let's go! The end of the, of the thing, the last scene, they didn't really get it until the night before we shot it, and we shot it last. And uh, they weren't sure what the last line should be. We needed a final line, a final, final line, a, a, a spleen-shattering uh, 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 belly laugh. Then S came up with nobody's perfect. We were not crazy about it, but it was late at night and we were pooped. So we decided, let's put it on paper so they can mimeograph it fully expecting to find something really funny when, it, when the time came to shoot the scene. That just goes to show you how little we know. Is wrote the scene and left it with me. And while well, he went off to, he took it off uh, to me with Billy. And I read it and he came back and he said, what did you think? I said, a marvelous scene. I said, but I think the ending is, the last line is weak. And he said, you're absolutely wrong, and that's what Billy thinks too, and the reason you're wrong is the following. This is a classic bit which the audience loves to know what's coming. They love anticipating a joke. He says, everybody in the audience knows the last line Jack has is going to be, I'm a man, and they're waiting and waiting and waiting for the explosion. He says, and then we surprise them. We give them no explosion. We give them the flattest line there is. Well, I have a terrible past. For three years now, I've been living with a saxophone player. I forgive you. I can never have children. We can adopt some. But you don't understand, Osgood. Uh, I'm a man. Well, nobody's perfect. They had a complete cut of that film a couple of days after the finish. I never saw another director do anything like that at all. He, he cut the camera, I mean, he cut the film in the camera. And I used to have, I'd be watching the scene and he would call cut. 
And I would say, oh, but he, he, he should let it go a couple more seconds. I kept thinking he was cutting things off too quick. And of course, he was cutting them exactly where he would cut in the film. And I never saw another director who was so precise and good at that as Billy Wilder was. I think that, that may have come from his, his training at Paramount, where he didn't want studio executives fooling with uh, angles that, that he decided he, he didn't like, and so they didn't exist. And so consequently, I, uh, we'd get a first cut in a couple of weeks. Been waiting long? It's not a long you wait, it's who you're waiting for. Thank you. But all Wilder's efficiency couldn't stop alarm bells ringing in the accounts department at United Artists, the Mirish Brothers' backers. It was a huge concern. <laughs> we, the picture went considerably, considerably over budget. Uh, this was, as I said, a, a still a, a rather new relationship for us with United Artists. We, we very much wanted uh, our pictures to, to be on or, or close to budget, and uh, it just wasn't possible with, with all the delays, and uh, we just had to keep our fingers crossed that, uh, that the movie going public would bail us out. <laughs> when they had the first sneak preview, it was the worst reaction of any film I have ever been in. I remember the first preview of the picture vividly. It was a disaster. The audience had come to see suddenly last summer, and it wasn't set up for comedy. And they never laughed, not once. Mothers and fathers were just taking their children by their hand about 10 or 15 minutes into the film and marching out of the theater and complaining on the way very loudly. What is, what is this terrible thing? Men running around in dresses and everything. Um, they didn't know if it was a picture about gays or what it was. It was w one laugher, Steve Allen, who earned my husband's gratitude forever, laughs consistently, he caught every single joke, but he was a lone voice in the theater. I'd like to say to the other 1,200 people that were in the theater that night, I told you so, dummies. As a matter of fact, I have a list of their names here. You should be interviewing them, because the real question is, why weren't they laughing? Every sensible person laughs at that comedy classic. Jack was brilliant, Tony was brilliant, the direction, the script, everything. So it really is, I'm, I'm serious on this point, it's very strange why the other people weren't laughing that night. Were they all that square? Who knows? We have no explanation for that original audience except that they were depressed, deeply depressed. Afterwards, Billy was in the lobby of the theater and all of the mirishes, the various mirai, were gathered around him and all of them were saying, Billy, you've got to cut 15 minutes out of this film or we can't even release it. It doesn't work. And not only that, you can't have a farce that runs two hours. It can't be done. No farce has ever run more than 140. And the next morning, Billy called me and said, uh, we're going to preview again this Friday in Westwood. I said, oh my God, the UCLA kids, a younger crowd and everything, that was the big final test. I said, oh, I said, gee, what did you cut? And he said, 60 seconds. I said, what? He said, that's it. If they don't like it, that's too bad for them. It's 60 seconds because I say so. Yes, if she was cut between Jack and me on an upper berth, Marilyn comes to my berth and she says, I can't sleep over Beanstalk, because he snores. So I say to him, here, you take my bed, and I'll go sleep in your berth. And I'm sleeping there with a pillow over my head, so I don't hear the snoring. Jack Lemon gets up, and he tiptoes down the road and climbs up in the sugar's berth on top of me. And as I try to lift my head up, he shoves it down. He says, remember the thing I was going to tell you about the secret I have? I tried to get up, shoves it down. He says, well, I'm going to tell you the secret. I tried to get up, he shoves it down. He says, I'm a man, and tears off his hair. 
the minute he turns over, it's, well, I slap the wig back on real quick and I say, you wouldn't hit a girl, would you? Billy just took that one scene and took the whole scene out. The scene by itself was, was terrific. It was very good. But as Billy said, it was gilding the lily. It was one scene too much on the train in that whole sequence. That's all. And he didn't touch the rest of the film. Why do you think they cut it? Well, it was one man humping another. It was that same bullshit that they did with Spartacus. That preview in Westwood was the best preview of any film I've ever been in. They screamed. The audience was going really bananas. Some of them got up because they couldn't take it anymore and went up to the back, to, I think, to go into the bathroom and continue screaming and hollering or whatever. But they just really went cuckoo, and it was wonderful. That was just I, beyond anything you could have hoped for. The, it, 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 it was just great, and uh, we felt that, that now we had... Uh, proved what we had set out to and that um, we look forward to having a, a really most successful film, which of course it was and is. Thousands of people are lining the street. In March 1959, only four months after shooting ended, Some Like It Hot premiered in New York and went on to become one of the year's biggest hits earning $13 million at the box office during its initial release. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Miller have arrived. Hundreds of photographers out there surround them. They can't even move to get in. They need that police protection, believe me. She looks fantastic, and I'm only looking at her hair. Not since Scarface, so much action. Not since the Marx Brothers, so much comedy. Not since the seven-year itch, so much Maryland. The best picture this year will also be the funniest. In fact, the best picture Oscar for that year was won by Ben-Hur. Despite its six nominations, Some Like It Hot only picked up a single statuette for best costumes. It's taken over 40 years for Wilder's Hollywood peers to recognize the movie as one of the best, if not the best comedy of all time. I think that Some Like It Hot is uh, still the best comedy script I ever read and I probably ever will. And I think that Billy was at his peak as a director, let alone as a writer. You don't need to look at it and say, oh, it lost a little. It's lost nothing, nothing. You sit in that theater and you giggle. And that's what a movie's supposed to make you do. And aren't I privileged? Really privileged, really privileged to be in the funniest movie ever made. Yes. What time's there? Good night. Good night, Daphne. Mods, sweet dreams of pleasant thoughts. Good night, Daphne. Good night, Gloria. Good night, Daphne. Dolores, dear, you sleep tight, you hear? Good night, sugar. Good night, honey. Good night, Daphne. Good night, Josephine.